My name is Maria, and you are listening to the podcast where we deconstruct someone's PhD experience so that you can reconstruct your own. This is a journey with many challenges, but you might find yourself in a similar situation as one of the guests here. Enjoy listening. Hello, Sashka. Hi. I'm going to dive right into the topic that I find amazing with you and why I wanted to uh, talk to you and what fascinates me about where you are now. Mm-hmm. And that's the fact that you are working at university and in parallel, you are studying psychology. Psychotherapy. And- psychotherapy Mm -hmm. and even starting to um, practice with your studies you are offering also therapy to people so tell me what made you choose to do psychotherapy Mm. it's interesting you're you're talking about the psychotherapy first i like it (laughs) Um, i'm curious now i'm curious i was actually curious what is she fascinated about? I wasn't sure. <laughs> um, psychotherapy. Um, well, it's not an it's 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 not uh, unusual that you mentioned psychology because uh, I was part of a science school in Serbia, where I did go to molecular biomedicine and to psychology. Uh, and I'm not sure why at the time it did not feel like those two will ever be li- related, but there was a part of me which really wanted to explore that and I really enjoyed it. Um, and I've done that for a year and then I had to do my studies and I kind of left it. But the interest was always there. I somehow, I can't not think of times where I wasn't interested in the human psyche, in the human behavior. Um, And I I mean, I don't know by your experience, but coming from Serbia, we are brought up on a very heavy literature, which is Dostoevsky and Tolstoy. And when you read them, it's really like, like, or, or even some of the, even some of the other, like, um, Some of the other uh, novels that we had to read, they're like stream of consciousness novels or really going deep. Um, So for me, it was really always there. But it was never in my consciousness that it's something that can become my profession or part of of what I offer. Um, And then I had had therapy on and off. um, since I was, well, more seriously since I started my PhD, but I had trials in Serbia at times when it wasn't so, when it was a bit expensive and not so popular. Um, so I didn't really have some, I didn't have enough environmental support to actually dive in. Uh, and then I started doing it when I was in, in, uh, in, in my PhD. And then when I came here, I had quite a difficult personal journey, um, which includes divorce, which on its own, it's very difficult, but then it's changing countries and everything that comes around. Um, And I've started doing my personal therapy, um, but really intensely. I had two to three sessions a week for almost two years, or no, for for full two years. Um, And then at some point, I, I don't even know when this idea started. I, I don't have like a memory. I think I was supported by my therapist somehow. And I don't have, now that you asked me, I'm actually not sure like when, what happened in me. It just felt like uh, such a natural transition that I don't even have like a point where it actually happened. Um, and then I was, because I'm quite... Um, how would you say that? Um, like someone who kind of 
don't like just goes into it like you know if i think i want it i just find the course i do everything that's necessary done that's it i'm i'm in it uh, and somehow that's what i did <laughs> i don't know um and you know, so yeah on now side, i am sorry yeah like on, on one side it doesn't surprise me at all as a researcher mm -hmm. You know, there is also this curiosity and you yes. want to understand. It's not like somebody tells you and you yeah. take it for granted and say, ah, oh, yeah, okay, yeah. it's like this. But you are like, okay, why is it like this? I want to understand. I want to be able to have the yes. model of it so that I can use yes. this myself. Yes. And I think it's a really important thing you said as a researcher, because until I started doing psychotherapy, I did not see psychotherapy as a research job, which actually is. Um, and I think there is something about being a psychonaut uh, instead of a cosmonaut. Um, but it, it's really interesting how being a researcher is facilitating my psychotherapeutic work, especially Gestalt. Gestalt actually, like, it has part of Gestalt work is experimentation. Like, there is a part which is called experimentation. Um, so, so Gestalt, I think maybe that's why I like it because, uh, it feels like, um, it, it feels like genuine research. Um, because it, it, it does feel like, uh, I am doing experiments, uh, daily, uh, with my clients and, and honestly with myself. I think, I think, I wouldn't really be a good therapist if I don't go places myself. So, so it's really, um, I, I had like an embodied, embodied experience of that yesterday where, where someone who was my client just told me until you did this, I didn't allow it to myself. And so there is something about being constantly in and out of researching myself and the environment and myself and the environment, but I didn't stop being a researcher as I started being a psychotherapist. Yeah. Now that you mentioned uh, like researching with yourself in the environment, yourself in the environment, uh, I'm reading a book which is called Awareness. And mm -hmm. it is also by a Gestalt therapist who is offering experiments, experiments of how to practice the awareness. And a lot of these things are... Mm -hmm you are becoming aware of the inner world and of the outer world, inner world, outer world, and then like following where yeah. does this awareness flow and how, yeah, how you are perceiving things, etc. cetera. Mm. Uh, this was just mm. a side note. <laughs> yeah, no, but it is, it is that. And, I, and, and there is something actually, um, last week, uh, I was on a, on a lecture here at the Crick, um, by professor Brian Cox, who is, I think that's his name. If I'm wrong, I'm sorry. Uh, but he was talking about black hole research. Um, and I was sitting there and I was, I was, and he, he started because it was also partially public engagement. And he started with some quotes about, well, how we think as scientists. And he, he actually said that we are very comfortable with doubt, uh, which, I want to question because we're humans and no human is comfortable with doubt. But I think therapy work is, is really um, helping us to be more comfortable with doubt so that we can be more comfortable even in the research space. Because I think sometimes even in the research space, we become very rigid and dogmatic and wanting to fit reality into our hypothesis versus using the hypothesis to test the reality. Um, so yeah, it's, it was just really interesting to me, uh, how much we think we own the research part and it only belongs to academia. Whereas I think it's much wider. It's a really a natural, uh, um, uh, emerging property of, of a human being living organism. Um, and I think it's also a capacity that is uh, a developing capacity. And I think many people can have it. But I think sometimes there is an elitist part in academia, which is like, mm, we're so special. Only we have this ability and capacity to deal with doubt and uncertainty and the unknown. 
Um, and it's true. We are more trained, maybe. Uh, and, and at times we fail miserably. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. But for sure, we're put in this setting, you say it nicely, where it's, um, well, it's in, it's a container where you have to be comfortable with the doubt and the unknown. If you go for a PhD, yeah. you know that that's expected of you. But if you go to do research in a company, for example, you also have to be uncomfortable uh, or comfortable yeah. with doubt and deal with the same things. And you don't necessarily get a title afterwards, you know, that you yeah. went in all these black spaces and dead ends and uh, failed experiments. But um, if you are not tied to academia, nobody's going to say, oh, bravo, look at you, you deserve a PhD for this. Yeah. Yeah. So there is this also yeah. big misconception that uh, if you have a PhD next to your name, you are the only one capable of doing this. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I really agree with that. And, and, and I, I really liked how you put it. I did not think about that in this way, to be honest, but it's true that, um, when the doubt becomes much bigger, when you finish the PhD, because then, and like, I think the postdoc is another very nicely PhD wrapped up like experience because you have a container, you have six years and you know, you're out. Um, um, so yeah, I think it's it's sometimes can be even even more disconcerting in in industrial research where you don't know if tomorrow someone can change the research direction and your team is going to be redundant or um or what you thought was true when you worked for for it on on one year is not profitable anymore and it's going to be a dead end. Yeah. Um, so I think I think it's really unfair from academia to claim that um, because I think it's just, it's life. I think it's life. I don't think it's academia. Yeah. And I always have this example of Nikola Tesla, for example, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who did not have a PhD, but the guy has a gazillion patents. I don't know how many has yeah. revolutionized the world. Um I mean, there are no words yeah. I can put there for the amount of effort uh, and breakthroughs that he did. And the academic circle did not accept him as, you know, he didn't go according to the standards of getting a PhD. But yeah, I mean, I want yeah. to say ultimately, who cares? <laughs> it, and it, it is. And ultimately, it is who cares. I think, you know, at the end, it's it's what comes from your work not what's what's next to your title yeah. um it is very comfortable to have that title because it it brings uh, a certain uh i don't know how to say like a certain perception and opens doors um but i don't think it does anything more than that to be honest no. Um, and, 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 you know, <laughs> I get it in myself. I, I have this voice, which sometimes says like, I'm a PhD and there is this person who is not. And like, you know, suddenly that person has created more or contributed more or, you know, done more and I'm not. And like, what does it mean about my value and my, I don't know what, um, so there is a, it's such a double edged sword, this, this thing, uh, because in a way it does, it does say something about someone's capacity to start something and to finish it. Um, and I don't want to take that away from anyone who has gone through the experience. And then it says only that. <laughs> yeah. And even um, if you don't finish it. So for sure, there is something, yes, there's this container, you went through it, yeah. you ticked all the boxes, did all the steps. Yeah. But even if you don't go through it all the way till the end, there was a journey yeah. that, I mean, let's yeah. say the finish is not, uh, you get a PhD a diploma, yeah. but your finish is, I tried three experiments, they failed, I proved that these three experiments are not the way to go. Yes. And I'm not interested anymore, or there is no other way or whatever it is, like 
there is yeah. a finish line for you that you can also decide and say, okay, now I find exactly. more fun doing other stuff. Yes, absolutely. And I think that's another thing that I feel uh, is not valued in academia is the, the failed experiments. And I quote unquote failed. And I wish there was more of, uh, of that available of, of our failures. Um, because, uh, and I don't think that's an interesting thing. I I'm saying academia, but I, I want to say I'm discovering that even psychotherapy world has that inside, like a positive bias. Mm -hmm. um, where we only show what worked and, and the pile of shit that didn't work is just somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Because when I, when I read, uh, you know, in psychotherapy, what we read sometimes is like transcripts of sessions, uh, when, you know, when you work with a person and then suddenly you've thought, you've thought of something and, and that opens up a really important topic for, for the person you're working with. And you know, and normally we would show something like you've said this one perfect sentence and the, you know, the person next to you starts crying because it brought a really difficult and important emotional experience. And it seems that they have processed something really big and important. But this happens, like I'm, I've now had 50 sessions. Out of those 50, the percentage where this actually happened is maybe one or two. And who says that this was my best work? Um, so, so I think that there is there is something about that's why that's why the podcast the podcast I started was the being and the doing and and we really we when I started with my friend in a flat we actually interviewed each other as is as if we were successful because. Because there was something about that, something about not giving voice to people who had experiences. Because what ultimately matters is what's your experience. Yeah. Uh, and everyone has had that experience. So everyone can teach us something. Yeah. Uh, and every experiment can teach us something. Even the one when someone tried and failed. Um quote unquote failed because what at the, what does that even mean yeah um, but it's interesting so yeah. what you say as if we were successful what, what does that mean that's it as if you were successful yeah yeah uh i think uh to to rephrase that we we discussed that it it's as if we are deemed by society <laughs> to be successful mm -hmm. because uh because what what usually happens is that you have someone who represents success by in societal standards. Uh, and then we, we actually spoke about it in terms of, um, a current fashion, you know, um, my, it, it's, it was a metaphor of my friend. It wasn't mine, but she did, she said something around like, you know, what if success sometimes is like fashion and like, you know, today it's really nice to wear this like beautiful dotted polka dotted thing. And then you will see me as very fashionable and successful, but tomorrow it's something completely else. And, and you will see me like a loser who doesn't really know you know, hasn't gotten anywhere in life. Um, so, so there is something so about true. societal perception yeah. of what success and how it is uh, field defined. You it know, is. you if you go if you go to academia, you will be seen successful for one thing that academia is defining as success. If you go to psychotherapy, it might be the exact polarity. It's like, have like how many times you cried today? Like, you know, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm quite exaggerating this, but for the purpose of, of making a good contrast, but. Yeah. And um, also taking the historical perspective of that, like, uh, let's take again, the fashion industry. You know, last uh, season, it was one color, it was fashionable. Now it's something different. Next year, it's something yeah. different. So also, if you would yeah. take a few generations, what is success for the generation of our parents? What is yeah. success for our generation? What is success for the generation yeah. after us? Is totally different thing. Different. Yeah. 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 
Yeah. It's very context dependent. And it's that's part of Gestalt that I really like uh, is this idea that we are always, the environment is always present in us. Um, and, and, and if we want sometimes to change, sometimes it's really important to change the environment. And yet sometimes we can influence the environment. So it's always this dance between us and the environment and how we how we are with that really so tell me your environment at the university and psychotherapy what is the link mm. there ah <sighs> the link i think uh, i'm i'm staying with the link somehow what's the link uh, i guess both of them are academic um both of them have are very both of them have containers, very output driven. Oh no, let me rephrase. Uh, um, yeah. How does your psychotherapy experience serve you in academia? Ooh, very good question. Um, uh, very much. Uh, first, it serves me to self-regulate, uh, to allow myself, for example, today I took a day off. Um, and to say, it's okay to take a day off. I mean, legally, I'm also <laughs> allowed to do that. Um, but it, yeah, it gives me that permission to say, take care of yourself first, because that's the only way you can serve anyone. And that includes my scientific colleagues, uh, my psychotherapy clients. Um, so that, that's a really important thing that, that psychotherapy showed me, uh, is to really notice what is it that I need? What is, how do I decide between urgent needs? How do I make space for com competing needs? Um, I think there is something, so, uh, I'm doing a group facilitation course at the moment, actually. Uh, and it was majestic to, to, to be part of it and to still be part of it. And there is something about having inner communities and how, how, we manage, how we manage those, how we treat those, how, we, how democratic are we within our different parts. You know, the part that at this moment actually wants to go and do an experiment, that wants to sit here with you, that actually wants to sleep because I haven't you know, slept enough in the last time. And so how do I negotiate between them so that when I am in an actual group of people who need to negotiate needs, I can do that with care and um, stability. So that's one thing. Another thing, uh, again, coming from my group facilitation course was what well, was a very liberating experience. We had an experiment where the facilitator asked us to say, we are here to do facilitation course. So we have a task, we have time boundary, all of that is there. And we all bring our something of our fields in this day and time. And he asked us to write three words, which are not part of the course, but are part of our current experience. And we laid them all on the ground. And it was incredible to see that at the same time that we are doing this course, there are so many things that are happening for those people. I mean, I, I don't want to share what was happening for others, but for me, I had to submit an essay. Uh, my parents were visiting. Uh, at work, I had some cells that were growing that I needed to take care of. Um, I need to finish a presentation. Um, I had my Gestalt training the next day. Um, and that's, that's all kind of nice stuff, but it does weigh on you. Some people have very big, had very big, ex oh, my, my rent has gone up for 30%. Some other people had like, you know, um, different existential problems with their families. And all of that is present also in our working environments. And it was very liberating to, to actually see that and not to have to then 
project onto other people. Is he angry at me or is he angry for him? Is he, uh, you know, is he uh, sad because I've done something? Or And it just gets like so much, takes away so much of the pressure of making a decision or checking. Um, what is it? Because it's already up front. It's already there. Uh, but when adult people are doing that, we all know that, yes, we are here, we are with this, and all of us can take care of this for ourselves. Uh, and I think that's what really allowed me to be in, 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 a, in a, well, I don't want to call it a competitive environment, but it is, it is a quite charged environment because there are competing needs. Um, and I think it really serves me to have more compassion for myself and for others uh, and to understand the messiness, to, to be with the messiness and to be okay with that uh, and not to use, uh, oh, this is professional or I'm professional as, uh, as a way of um, almost shaming someone. Uh, mm -hmm. Because I think uh, we often shame each other into being a certain way uh which is not really facilitating the process of research no um like just the so yeah. extreme example if somebody would come and cry in a workplace this is probably by a lot of people kind of maybe not inappropriate or unacceptable but they don't know how to deal with it it's like, yeah. it's, it's something that nobody expects that you would come and burst into tears, Yeah, but it happens more often than we think. And I yeah. know of a lot of cases where people are just stuck because as you say, life can be overwhelming. It's not only your research. There are a lot of stuff next to it happening Yeah, and things go in parallel. It's not that you do your research and everything else yeah. is waiting for you to finish that research and then yes. uh, shit uh, hits the fan, but... <laughs> It's uh, all yeah. at the same time. And yeah, that's beautiful. Like if uh, you can have compassion towards other people and talk about the, those stuff as well, be a human mm. at work. Understand that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there are so, so much more things happening. You know, like we all have our desires, wishes, dreams, things yeah. that we come with and uh, they also are differently charged for all of us and what something yes. means for for you and me yeah we we have a different way of carrying it and expressing it exactly exactly and and it it doesn't always work uh, and it's not it's 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 going to in i mean even in the group facilitation course there was a huge conflict and so and it's inevitable to to for all of that to leak in and to to become part of the thing but i think it's so important to recognize that it will happen that we cannot avoid it that we we have effective ways of dealing with it um rather than kind of expecting that it will just solve it by itself and magically vanish and never come into our field. Uh, and, and the more we are on this side, actually, the more it's going to come. Because in Gestalt, there is a paradoxical theory of change. Like the more you're trying to be something you're not, uh, the, less are you, the less you're going to get there. Um, so it's really about accepting what is here and now. And I'm... I don't want to sound preachy because it looks like I figured all this out. Uh, I haven't. Uh, so, so I fail. I say the wrong thing. I am messy. I, um, I, uh, I don't judge time well at times. Uh, I like I do so many things that I know can can contribute to to the field. But it's 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 not about that. It's it's more about uh, holding yourself with compassion and others when this happens, uh, and and knowing knowing to name things and knowing to sting with the discomfort when someone else names things for you because you know we all have different boundaries and as a, and yeah competing needs um, and just checking and noticing that doesn't say anything about our value. 
um, but it might say something about what we can do here and now uh, and what the adult part of us can do here and now with that. Yeah. No, I have to say I really love this uh, part of you and attitude that you are interested in the psyche of the person and that you bring that mm. to the work environment. And as you say, like as a look at the human as a whole, not as a researcher, mm. you know, if you are having a group meeting and you are only discussing research, um, yeah, there are other stuff happening in all of us. And yes. And also you have to work with people for years. So it's not yes. only research that is going to be important, but how you build relationships with those people, how yeah. you take care of each other, of yourself as well. That's something important. And yeah, maybe not so present in academia. Mm -hmm. I, I definitely think what's not present is the facilitation of the undercurrent. Uh, I think, yeah, it's really present that we we find ways to work with with the data and the research and kind of, but we definitely do not find, no, we don't create space. We might find ways if we create space, but I think what we don't do is we don't create space for these things to emerge in a, in a way that can actually be uh, um, healthy, healthy is a difficult word, but I'll use it. Um, and I think I, I wish there was more of that. Um, I, uh, I think to be honest, w working at a crick, you know, the, the thing is we carry different academic experiences and environment from different places. Um, and I guess there were parts like I've I worked in Serbia and Switzerland and and um, and in the UK, um, and I guess what I really liked about the the quirk is that at least um, there are moments like there there are efforts, and they are coming from uh, from the researchers um, to to start and build these spaces where we can talk about stuff. Um, one thing that I don't like, um, is that this often comes from people who have gone through something really difficult, but that is called, um, I've learned this from actually from a lady that has given a talk, uh, at, uh, at, uh, at the Crick, uh, it's called the minority tax. So it's people who are minorities, either women or people of color or people with disabilities who have experienced these struggles and are seeing them are the ones that are bringing this as, uh, as into awareness. But that takes them an extra mile because they already have those problems and that takes them an extra mile, an extra work to do which people who don't have any of those problems don't do, therefore they can do more other work. And so it's such a huge imbalance. Um, and, and I was quite disappointed when I went to the group facilitation course because I expected a little bit of, I mean, it's a course in a Gestalt center, ad admittedly, but it's, it's about organizations. And I was expecting that there will be people who are, you know, from a corporate world, people who are actually leading teams. Uh, but no, like everyone in my course was either a therapist or a person from HR uh, or um, someone who is a coach or someone who works with people who are leading teams. And this for me was really saddening is that and even how, as we speak sometimes at the Crick, uh, we don't speak about like, oh, how can we do it? It's like, how can we behind the back of our bosses or, or tutors or find a way so that they are aware that this is actually what they need to do? It's like, it's such like, a, I mean, like, I, I, I feel like that, that should be the responsibility of the person who is actually leading something to say, well, look, I'm actually leading 20 people here. 
I'm not doing the science anymore. What my role is now is group facilitation, really. And it and it's those skills that I need to hone now. I've honed my scientific technical skills for the last 10 years. That's why I'm here. And that's why I'm good at what I'm doing. That's why I am paid for this job. But now my job role is, is actually completely di- different. And it involves... Um, like the facilitator role involves a training role, a uh, facilitating role, a leadership role, um, and you use yourself to do all of these things. And it's, it's you don't necessarily need to do these things yourself, but you kind of need to recognize what am I able to do and what am I not able to do, but I need to delegate because someone actually has to do it. Yeah. Uh, but what happens often is that the, like the facilitation role and the leadership role is kind of like dispersed on people who will just take it naturally. But then that 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 work is not recognized. Um, and that's like what one of my therapists would say. It's like an emotional Sherpa. Uh, it's like, you know. The Sherpas are the ones who are carrying the weight where like, you know, all this like fancy um, uh, mountaineers have, you know, climbed Mount Everest. But I think we need to recognize the invisible workload that is still happening. And it often falls on women and not necessarily. Um so I think we need to really recognize that that is there and it's in the workplace. It's in every workplace, but it's in academia. And I think, I think academia is quite slow on taking that up. And I have to say, being at the creek at the forefront, there are conversations happening, but the creek is the forefront and it's still not there. So imagine where it's, you know, in places where, where academia is probably even further back in terms of time and, and, and how, how it works. So, yeah, I think that's how it informs me. It was a long answer, but I feel like I needed to say all of that. No, it's beautiful. I mean, thanks for bringing this up. And I'm thinking of like, how do you get there? And by there, I mean, how do you get to a place that the person who is in a leader role understands what kind of qualities and skills are needed for being a leader. I have the impression that oftentimes in academia, mm, there's this uh, self-pampered belief that you can do anything. Mm. So it's like, oh, you know, I'm now a problem solver. Like, sure, when you finish your PhD, you are definitely equipped to solve problems. You are a problem solver, Mm -hmm. but having good communication skills, having good skills uh, to delegate things, to even like to trust people that they can do the job themselves and not sit behind their back. Um, You also need a lot of self-awareness to... That's the word. I just wanted to say that. (laughs) Yeah. A lot of self-awareness to say, oh, I'm lacking this or there is something that I can do about it or need to do about it but it's not so um, nurtured to say okay leaders let's see how we can support you to be even better yeah I don't know Uh, to be honest it's not an easy answer to this question I interviewed um, for the podcast um the Nobel Prize laureate, one Nobel Prize laureate, Randy Shackman, and I asked him a similar question, um, and he had a really good response that he said it's on everyone to choose that for themselves, and unfortunately, it probably is. Um, I think we can systemically do something about that uh, if it's recognized by the leadership again. Uh, because if it's not recognized by the, by the leadership, then it's again an uphill battle. And I don't know, there is a Serbian saying which calls uh, the fish stings from the head. Um, uh, I, think, I think it's really important that at least one person in the leadership knows the value of that. 
and that's why diversity and 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 inclusion are so important if you end up with a leadership of 12 white men um well you won't bring the values that i stand for or maybe you stand for if at least one of those men doesn't stand for them but the chances are low because historically that's not what they have been standing for um and so i think i think it's i think it's something that will change with time with bringing more difference in the workplace um and and really starting to have different values and and questioning one's values i think that's what what i am always puzzled with academia is like questioning what is is our job and yet we fail to question ourselves and i think this um this dis discrepancy often eludes me really uh, because there is one actually there is one gestalt book i was reading and there is a quote from that which says uh, a lot of uh, a lot of intellectual energy is invested in ignorance if the need for illusion is deep and i think I think it's it's this. Uh, if we need to preserve a self-image that is grandiose, that can be perfect, always problem solving, never needing help, and um, then 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 we will try to maintain that at any cost, and often that will be at the cost of the people that are working with us. Um, so. It's a really tricky question. Um, I mean, the way we're doing it now to me really seems like, oh, let's just kind of do something that, 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 that. but I wish we could have more direct conversations, uh, which will be facilitated uh, by, uh, by people who are experienced in that. Um, and then I think it might steer things up. It might bring up a lot of conflict, but that's not necessarily bad. When facilitated, conflict can really uh, be very rich for, for everyone involved. Um, so, so, yeah, my answer is start from yourself. Uh, <laughs> but, and by, by doing that, often you'll be able to do what I do now. I've, you know, I've started from myself. I question myself. I now see what are all my wrongdoings <laughs> and all the things I can do better. And I can now clearly speak for myself and for my values. And by doing that, maybe someone will say, oh, yeah, I recognize myself in it. And then, you know, by that, then there will be like a snowball effect. Yeah. Um, and so let's just my say hope that... is that. Go, go, sorry. Yeah. So, no, my, 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 I just want to say that my hope is that by me speaking about this and about experience and, and allowing other people to speak about their experiences more, more, and more, we will get to a point where someone will actually start listening. And I also want to acknowledge you and congratulate you for doing this work because let's say it's not easy. If you have an example mm. of how things are being done, it's way easier to copy when you are in doubt. You know, even like being mm. a parent, which I'm not, but uh, yeah. this is a, an example that I see very often. Like when you don't know what to do, usually you would copy what your parents did um, yeah. because you know, like that was a solution that worked. It was kind of safe in a way. And yeah. also going to a certain group and you see a certain group leader. And if you become one day a group leader and you are in a place you have never been before, because this is a total new role for you. Um, yeah. And, and it's difficult. It's difficult to manage so many people, to attract money, to be also in different uh, political circles, to um, yeah, secure the position of your group. Um, if you don't, if you are not 
probably supported from within, like to know what you are mm -hmm. standing for and how you are going to go about certain things, even though it's uncomfortable, even though you're going to pay the consequences, consequences and um, yeah, it can be easier to just copy what somebody else did. But mm -hmm. my wish is that more people take the road like you did, uh, a road of becoming self-aware of your, um, how do you say it? Like the good things that you can bring and the bad things also. I mean, some mm -hmm. minor things that are maybe not fitting there, but being self-aware and choosing for yourself rather than just copy pasting a system that has been existing for hundreds of years yeah and it's not uh, revolutionized yeah and i think i think the chances like that's a little bit the beauty of academia because we are to some extent forced to change um and at least you will have two experiences if you go to a postdoc of different leadership styles. Um, and so that's already helping because, uh, because you can see what are the, the, the pluses and minuses of each. And, and if you are more curious, like now what I'm really learning is I've been now in maybe four or five different groups as part of like my gestalt training and every one of them really brings out an aspect of me which you know you can start to see how you actually behave in groups and how in different groups you're a different pe person and and all these kind of things and and i think um i think there is something so the facilitation training is not about defining what's good or not but it's really about finding your personal style but as you said, um, if we are copying uh, something that's uh, just given to us, that's not a personal style. That is someone else's style and probably not fit for purpose because someone else's style was a style for a, that environment, that context 20 years ago when they were doing that, what you are now trying to do. But the context has changed. The people have changed. The expectations have changed. So it's really about finding who you are in every and who are you now and now and now and now and having the capacity and the energy to cope with that um, and, and be adaptable because, I mean, they quote Einstein on this. I'm pretty sure he's not he who said that, but intelligence is adaptability. Um, it's really finding ways to respond rather than react, mm -hmm. to respond to the situation because only then we kind of live more or less in the now. It's never possible. I mean, it's, it's, that's an ideal, but, but it's, it's something like, you know, we can, we, we are never saints, but we strive for something. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's kind of, yeah, testing that. Yeah. What's now? Yeah. And now? And now. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. And uh, talking about Gestalt, well, I don't know too much uh, history of um, psychology and psychotherapy, but there was this one point that I saw that at certain points, people thought that in isolation, you would uh, find out who you truly are. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and now it is actually turning towards like only in connection with the other, you can find out who you truly are. Mm. And I yeah. would also like yeah. to bring this metaphor to people doing PhD where we are mm. often isolated and we go back to ourselves, to our lab, to our experiment, um, away from other people and also hoping we're going to find the answers there but actually in contact with our colleagues, in contact with our mentor, in contact in conferences, friends, whatever, any yeah. contact, we actually understand who we are, what we stand for, what's important for us, what's not important. And this changes as well over time. 
Yeah. I mean, in isolation, you become neurotic <laughs> because, because nothing new enters your system. So you are constantly recycling old ideas. It's, 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 uh, I think that's, you know, I, I don't think any quote unquote genius person would be genius if you put them in a white room with no sensory input. I mean, we've done these experiments. It really makes people go crazy. Hmm. So it's, it's all this sensory input. Some people, for some people, that relationship can be with something in nature. For some people, it's with another human. For some people, it's... So what we are in relationship with, because we are always in relationship. Mm -hmm. There is no moment in time where we are not in relationship. We are in relationship to the air. We are in relationship to um, the ground. Um, it, there is always a relationship. And depends. it just depends which relationships are we drawing from. But it's almost like, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not someone who does physics, but you know, like you need to perturb the system <laughs> from time to time in order for the system not to give you the same results over and over again. Um, so, so I think it's, it's really important to remind ourselves that we do not exist without our environment and our environment includes people. And what I really don't like about academia is this idea that it's a one person thing, especially because we know about so many times where ideas have been stolen, not acknowledged, all these kind of things. And, and I think this, this, this thing of the first author, last author thing also doesn't help because it also strengthens the idea that everything is in the individual. And at times it is, and at times it isn't. And, and it's, it's really acknowledging that thing that uh, we draw from each other and I'm no one without my colleagues who will give me input. Absolutely. Um, and also yeah. like, we are no one um, if there are no those who came before us because we continue exactly. from where the other people stopped exactly. and all the work exactly. that has been done before us. Yes. Yeah. In my PhD defense, I, I think I've said this in some podcasts, but in my PhD defense, I actually used in, in, uh, well, they have it in, in, uh, in, um, in uh, Spain, uh, and, and in, and in Croatia, uh, sorry, in Montenegro, the, the, the human towers. Uh, and that's what I used at the end of my PhD. I mean, I would definitely not be there, uh, on that tower if there were not this solid foundation of people who have, invested in me, gave me their time, their thoughts, their energy, their effort. It's almost like it's a river that's flowing in me and, and it's a river that goes out in me from me. And it's just this constant flux, uh, of, of, of energy, but it would be so, um, I don't know, out of touch with reality to claim, uh, everything that, yeah, I feel like I'm a, definitely a vehicle. I'm a prism, like, you know, through which things, you know, I don't know the, the word. It's not reflect, but this, um, diffract. Uh, so that's amazing. I, I, I want to own that. I, they will never diffract, dif like they will uniquely diffract through me because I have my experiences, my strengths, weaknesses and everything. And that energy is not only mine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then related to it. And before it's too dark in your room, I want to yeah, address I was that. Noticing the... that it's like, oh. <laughs> but it's actually very I beautiful. Can, yeah. I was waiting for the moment to go onto the painting behind you. And now the light is uh -huh. perfect that, uh, how I see it, it's like a, it's an ultrasound of a womb. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a new life behind you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So tell, tell me something more about it. Yeah. Ooh, um, I don't know if I have words yet. Uh, I want to say more about the process because this painting is a process. 
and it's my process. Um, and it will last, it will be a yearly work. So I've started it in January and I will end in December. So I'm not sure what's going to be the end, the end product, the, the end of this painting. Um, but it is, it is my place for, it's like, it's my witness. It's the witness of my current state of being. And actually you can see it nicely matches my clothing. Um, and it's, I definitely think I'm entering a new identity through it. It's probably my identity, even maybe as a leader, um, as a therapist, uh, maybe even as a leader of my own life, um, of, of, of making decisions for myself, taking charge and responsibility for that. Um, and it has, it has before this, it had four or five layers. Um, so it started with, um, trust, open, no trust, soft, open. Those are the words. And they were held in a kind of a cradle. Uh, and I think what that means for me is that trust builds the softness in me to open up. So that's an important thing for me. Um, and then after that, there was, there was, there was inside, uh, eventually I will, I will share this with the world, but there was, there was, um, kind of a doubtful watcher, uh, that's how I called it. And I really needed to know what that doubtful watcher was. So I kind of expanded it and it became a, an image of a woman. Interestingly, and that was quite incredible. And I'm, I'm hoping this will happen. But when I drew that, that image of a woman on Facebook, I got an image of, of a woman in real life who looks exactly like that and lives in London. <laughs> um, uh, so I hope to interview. She's an artist and, and I can't, I, I hope to interview her and meet her. Amazing. Her name is Sue Kreitzman. Look at her images. She's, she's just an incredible 80 something year old woman. Incredible. And, and then there, I watched the avatar and there was loads of destruction and there was like a lot of rage in me and a lot of unprocessed rage and, and destructive power. And so I, I've covered everything in black. So that's the black you see. Uh, but then there was like these white dots, uh, that they actually became the seed of potential. And so all these flowers that, I don't know, you can see some of here, um, like they're all flowers, but I'll send you like the original image. Um, they are basically all the budding life within that darkness of, of, of the destruction. And, and then I actually drew something on paper, uh, that when I was drawing this, I wanted to transmit, but on the paper, it looked like a mother and child, whereas here it came out only the baby. And in psychotherapy, that's actually separation anxiety. And I, 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 I kind of stopped with my old therapist. So there was a little bit of that separation going on. Then there is like an internal psychological process of separating from my parents internally and becoming an adult. Um, and, and again, a budding new life for me after a lot of, a lot of deadness for, for quite some time during my postdoc. Um, and then interestingly, um, the girl I work with, she, she called me like, do you see a face? And I was like, oh yes, I so see it. So then this part came out, but what came out is really a part of me, which cuts me off from life because this was like, um, like the umbilical mm. cord that was connected to all the flowers, but then I cut it out and, and it really asked, it really kind of, uh, it, it really left me with a question, how do I cut out myself from life? And what is it that they cut myself out from? And one of the answers I have now is that by cutting out myself from rage, from hate, from all these feelings that are like not supposed to be felt, 
uh, actually, it's a really valuable life energy I'm cutting out for myself. Uh, and now I think I'm integrating actually, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a yin and yang, um, the polarities of myself and holding them my, on my own. I don't need to, I don't need to externalize them. I think they are in me and now I can be like, Hmm, am I hateful? Am I loving? Can I be both? Where, like, am I a little bit hateful in this loving space or am I a lot of hateful in this, you know? So it's like constant check-in with not wanting to reject any of that, but welcoming it as an information. So that's where I'm now. I'm not sure was this going to be um, in uh, December, six months from now. We are now yeah. four months in this year and it's quite a lot of yeah. things. It's a beautiful story. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I find it interesting that you decided to take, to decide a timeline when you are going to end it. Because mm -hmm. like for artists, that's probably one of the most difficult things to say, my piece of art is now finished. When you start painting, yeah. like when is the last movement with the brush that you do and you say, now that's it because mm. you can ultimately you can never finish it no well i think that's part of me it's the same with a paper you know there's always one more experiment you can do of course <laughs> it's of like course. there's always like there's always one more thing i can test um and i think i think that's why it's really important to have a container and actually um you don't see my other painting but it's behind this um that one stopped and this one is really similar actually it's a continuation of that painting ultimately uh, so it seems i'm still churning up and processing some somewhat similar things but i can't explain when i was doing that other painting it really felt finished when i put the last it was like something was born. I felt lighter. I felt it was the time. And it, and I think this, and it's very organic. Um, I think there is something in us which knows, you know, and, and that's something I learned recently. I was watching a really good podcast which they were, in which they were talking about development of morality um, and how first we have the moral of our parents, then we have a moral of the group we're in. But then ultimately, and this, it's not like a be all end all theory of morality, but ultimately the, the final step of, of development is when you have an inner sense of morality is not like what's good for the world. It's not what is good. For, is this good for me? How will I feel after I do this? Will I feel like shit or will I feel okay? And that defines your personal morality and that's your inner compass. And so I'm sure this can be investigated and at times probably needs to be a, like recalibrated. Uh, but it's, I think it's an important thing to also constantly calibrate um, and, and, and just learn how to notice when something is done for you. Uh -huh. uh, because it might not look finished for, for someone else. Uh, it might look like shit for someone else. But if it looks okay and you're satisfied and something for you has happened, then it's done. Oh yes. And uh and this is I think it's the same with papers like you know it might not feel it might feel done for my boss but if it doesn't feel done for me maybe I want to insist on it being done in the way that I feel okay. And that's what that's where the complexity lies. Uh constantly having those negotiations and that's the complexity of anyone who holds a group of people noticing what their processes are and everyone isn't the different. There's like, there is so much multidimensionality of process uh, and, and just noticing what is your responsibility in that and what's not and all these kind of things. Definitely. And what you say, I, I somehow always take this dramatic thing of uh, quitting a PhD, <laughs> but it can, it can be mm -hmm. also applied to simpler yeah. things. So as you say, like finishing a paper. Yeah. But and, and like, that's the thing, P 
quitting a PG is not at all dramatic. No. That's, it feels like drama inside. But on the outside, if you would quit a PhD in front of my eyes and I'm your supervisor, I will be like, great job. You've decided something that's good for you. Yes. I don't want to keep you here against my will. Yes. I want you to be here for you. And if you, what you are and what I am matches, amazing. I do want you to be respectful of my time, to tell me this enough in advance, all these kind of, um, you know, technical things, uh, which will make, you know, my life easier in that way. But ultimately, my real goal is I want you to be okay. Yeah. I want and you to discover yourself. Yeah. And giving space for the person to grow because this might not be the environment where they can do that and where exactly. they can thrive. Exactly. So when you exactly. give the space to people, I mean, right now, you know, I got this from my current boss at a certain point. She told me openly, she was like, no, like if you have a better opportunity, just go for it. Don't let me stop you. And I was like in awe there mm -hmm. looking at her. I was like, wow, yeah. you know, you really feel like I feel that this woman, she wants me to succeed no matter where. You know? And then, and paradoxically, then you want to stay with her even more. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> because Because, because as long as it's, it's just, it's, it's always this thing. I, I just wrote this today. Unfortunately, it's in Serbian, so I can't really, um, but, but it's always what we have a, uh, like, um, Zabrana forbidden, uh, uh I When don't have the word. forbidding you. Yeah. Yeah. It's always something we are forbidden to do is when we want to do it. Yeah. And, and it's like, as soon as you have the permission Suddenly, you're like, well, now that you are allowing me to do this, now I'm actually choosing to stay f with you. And that's, I think, like, like for forbidding something to people is, is actually taking away their choice. And that's when, when people feel like, you know, and, and sometimes you have to do that. Sometimes, you know, you, you have boundaries. And then that's what's important as a, as a leader to be like, you know, I'm in this, as a leader, you know, I'm a junior group leader. I'm in this stage of my career. This is what I can offer you as a junior group leader. Um, and I would love you that you respect these boundaries that I currently have. And they're not necessarily always my boundaries. They're boundaries of the field I am in. They're boundaries of my, um, I don't know, of my um, uh, grant or, or whatever. But I think what makes people comfortable, at least what makes me comfortable, different people will be comfortable with different things. But I think it's really important to also know where their boss's decisions are coming from. Mm -hmm. Because if, you know, it's different if I come and tell you, well, now we need to work 10 hours a day and you need to obey me. And it's different when I come and tell you, listen, at this moment, we have this grant to write, which will allow us to do this and this and this. It, it will require maybe from you working a bit longer on these days. I would like you to take some holidays after that time. And then so that we can have more freedom, flexibility, do the experiments you like. Da, da, da. And when you explain it like that, then suddenly it becomes a choice. Because it's like, this is why we're doing it. Are you willing to go for that? And, and if you're not... That's the important question, asking, are you on board with yes. this? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And, and if you're not, then I need to make adjustments. That doesn't mean I will value you less. I will value you exactly. I'm just going to need to add people who at this moment have the capacity or willingness to do it. Yeah. And, and these are things that, that, I mean, I had to give that permission to myself. I had to say to my boss, I do not have the capacity for this now. And I needed to, and it wasn't easy. I needed to say, this is not going to be my paper. It has to be someone else's. Mm -hmm. And I needed, I needed to be okay with that as well, mm -hmm. because it's, it's also, we as 
as workers have the responsibility to be like, well, I've sat with my boss and my boss said, if you want this, then this, if you want this, then this. And I said, well, this is what I want. Well, then there is nothing to be resentful for. We had an agreement. Yeah. So I think it's it's really a two-way street because I, I don't want to put it all on like, you know, we all have agency, but all these things need not to be the underlying current, which we never talk about. I mean, they just need to be very there and something that we discuss and, and constantly negotiate. Yeah. And it does take a lot of energy and sometimes we'll be messy and fail and not do it and send an email late and all these kind of things. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's important to at least have it in awareness how important it is yeah. to, to, to bring them to the surface and not to assume things. Definitely. And also keeping people on board and in the loop because you as yes. a leader, you can have the overview of things and not communicate yes. them and then yes. deliver a message such as, okay, you need to work 10 hours now and not deliver a message. Why is that important? And then people yeah. don't feel compelled. Uh, you know, yeah. it's like, oh, I'm part of this group and my boss is asking me to work extra hours, but I have no idea why am I doing it? Like, what yeah. will I get out of it? What will the group get out of it? Yes. What happens before, after? But if you communicate clearly what is the benefit for all of us in that, then people are more compelled to jump yeah. on board. It's like also yeah. there's a train going in a certain direction. If you don't write which direction it's going, like... Why would somebody uh, yeah. go there? Why would someone <laughs> jump on the train? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's like, yeah. oh, I'm going in this direction. We're traveling for 10 hours. Do you want to jump on board? Like, not really. Like, But if you explain yeah. the process, then people are, yeah. they feel like you include them as well. So they feel a yeah. part of it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think if you do what you just described, then the most anxious people will jump on the train and your work with them will be really hard because you will constantly have things that are really uh, not come. They haven't come from the right place. Therefore, they will have fights among themselves and you will have fights with them. Um, so the chances of you, uh, of them, making the right decisions for themselves from a place of response rather than reaction mm -hmm. uh, is actually um, increasing your success. But it's not seen like that because we constantly think we are in a state of crisis. Mm -hmm. And in academia, I, I mean, we are so much not. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And I think we artificially create that crisis state and I say we, I think that's coming from our childhood environments in which so we've, we've learned to that crisis is the only way we know how to function. And then we just recreate that environment so that we can actually use all our coping mechanisms <laughs> effectively. But, uh, but I think it's important to remind ourselves we're not there anymore. It's safe. Uh, this is not for us, it's a war or for some people, an abusive family or for some people, whatever. I mean, these, these kind of reactions can come from, from so many different ways. Um, so yeah. I think it's really important to remind ourselves that it's not a crisis. Mm -hmm. And we are not, and even people who are working in crisis situations need to have rest sleep, all of these things, because the chances of them handling that crisis really poorly yeah. um, are really high. So, yeah. so I think it's important to remind that we are not gods. We are just humans with limited capacities. Definitely. And coming back to this previous topic of uh, you as a leader, including or not including people who are coming with you, I would open an invitation for people who are on the other side and they're not receiving um, this explanation, where is the train going, <laughs> to, yeah. to ask a question. So not to just go on board yeah. with like, oh, my boss said that uh, this has to be done and I have to work for 10 hours. 
and then also maybe you hold a certain feeling and how you get in it uh, as you say like there are going to be quarrels and everything because things are not clean but if you go there and you are and you ask okay openly just okay what is in it for me what is in it for the group what do we get out of it if things are not communicated um hopefully you get an answer if you don't get an answer then also tell something about what kind of relationship you can bring you can build in that environment but uh it's an encouragement not to just go with the flow but yeah ask things for yourself as well yes Yes, we all have agency and I think that's the most important thing. And we we need to remember to use it. Um and, and to bring what we are best at is questioning. Yeah. And being uh having not a critical as in criticizing, but critical as in discerning attitude towards life and others. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting when you say criticizing, we always think that uh, when somebody is criticizing, it's there's something wrong or bad, but as you say critical is just interrogative. Like in it's yeah. In, yeah, you are asking questions, you want to understand the reasons behind it and the motives. Yeah. Yeah. And also coming back to this thing mm-hmm. of crisis, we are not in a state of crisis. And yeah, PhD is also not a crisis, even exactly. though oftentimes we see it as one. And I yeah. hear a lot of people saying, oh, you know, um, I am going to continue when my PhD is finished. Like now I don't have time for it. I don't have time for sports or like there are other priorities that I need to focus on. So I will focus on them after I finish my PhD. But that means a few years. So between three and six, let's say, you are putting your life on hold. Right. Just to say that a lot of people see PhD as, I don't know how to put it, but uh, it's the utmost priority in this period of your life. And it's like, leave me alone. I'm doing a PhD, you know, like this is very yeah. important. Uh, yeah. Which it does suck. sometimes feel so yeah yeah which can suck for your family members for your friends uh, you know they can be like okay sure mm-hmm. i also have other stuff that i'm dealing with but uh <laughs> i'm also willing to hang out and build mm-hmm. something in the meantime so just to say that life happens simultaneously there is no yes doing phd and doing life there is phd part of your life yeah. I mean, that's, that's what I hope to model. I don't know how successfully, but I think doing all these things, I think it's important, but you know, I'm always afraid. Well, at times I'm so different and then, and then, you know, I'm not sure what would my lab mates tell you about me because maybe the story will be completely different. Maybe they would be like, she's really not managing herself well. Um, but but I, I do feel it's really important to at least take the agency of making the PhD the experience you want it to be. Oh, yes. Yeah. Because those are beautiful years. I really, you know, now looking back at it, you're probably in your mid-20s, majority of people when they do their PhD. So yeah. you are past this teenage stuff when you have to be liked yeah. by everybody and you just want to fit in. And it's the years when... You probably have an income, so you can also yes. try out stuff, spend some money on yourself. You go maybe abroad. These are your new experiences. Yeah. It's beautiful. There are so many options and possibilities for you yes. to explore, develop, search for different things. Yes. And I believe that this is... And also possible. often within your in- environments and organizations, the CRIC, for example, is a super rich environment. Like every week there is a lecture of a person that I really want to hear. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, 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 and everyone in the CRIC is just so diverse and someone is singing, someone is dancing, someone is doing a comedy night and, and, yeah. and you know... So I think it's really important to to relish that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
and use this time and explore. I mean, the whole mm -hmm. life is an exploration, but yeah, just the, take it as it comes. Be the researcher of your own life. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Oh my God. Let's finish with that. It's beautiful. Mm. Thanks a lot for sharing everything that is happening around your academic career. We barely touched the fact that you're working in academia, but I love the diversity of things that you are busy with. And yeah, that's also what mm. makes it beautiful. All this, uh, complex experiences and things that uh, and interest mm -hmm. that you have. Thanks a lot for the questions. And I, I, I do notice at times that I'm missing to talk about my research. Um, so, but I'm going for conference next week. So there will be an opportunity there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, let's make another episode of podcast uh, at a certain point exactly. where you will talk about your research. So, <laughs> Yes. Yes, but thanks a lot. Your questions were really lovely. Thank you for being so open and sharing your experience. It means a lot to me. I had a lot of fun listening to it and I hope to other people it will be interesting as well. Thanks for listening to this podcast episode. If there was anything that you discovered or found remotely interesting, do share. I'm always curious to hear what is it that you resonated with. See you in the next episode.